for an athlete in the heat of battle to suddenly lose it, not right. I, I snapped in reaction, and the rest is history. And I will learn from this horrible mistake. That I team with the fallout over bite night. Live from South Florida's news station, WSBN 7. This is 7 News at 10 o'clock. Hello again, everybody. Former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson opening his mouth once again, this time to apologize. Yeah, the heavyweight is attempting to iron things out after this weekend's bite night, and tonight Tyson is fighting once again, this time to keep his career alive. Our extensive night team coverage begins with Brian Andrews at a boxing ring in Wynwood tonight, Brian. Well, Kelly, South Florida is talking about Iron Mike's big bite. Matter of fact, he had two big bites, and everybody's wondering why was he biting in the ring? Well, we've been to several boxing areas in South Florida tonight. This is one of them. We are at Garrett Leprechauns in Wynwood, the gym here. As a matter of fact, in the ring, we have amateurs. We also have a former Olympian, David Diaz. These are all people who say, hey, what's up with Iron Mike? And tonight at other gyms, they're asking the same question. I'm here to apologize today, to ask the people to, ex to expect, to the people that expect more from Mike Tyson to forgive me for snapping in the ring and doing something that I've never done before and will never do again. Tyson's trying to get at Holyfield again, I believe. I apologize to the world. Iron Mike says he's sorry for disgracing the sport of boxing, biting Evander Holyfield not once, but twice when things got tough during Saturday night's big fight. Professional boxing is a sport many of these amateur athletes hope to excel in. They work out hard in their quest for physical best. But their workout slowed to a stop when Mike Tyson stepped up to the mic to explain his bizarre behavior. I just, I just snapped and reacted and did what many athletes have done and had and have paid the price for it. To do for what he did is not right for everybody else. It's not right for sports. And I think Tyson should get suspended or at least, you know, you know, take it farther than what it just has been, you know? I know it's useful for what he did, but he apologized, so they should forgive him. He needs to see a psychologist and get his mind right because it, this is just, this is unheard of. South Florida author Martin Fagenbaum has co-written a book about Mike Tyson called The Inner Ring. His life has been in such a shambles in the past few years that, as Tyson said himself today, he snapped. He had like a nervous breakdown, but it was not because of the fighting of Andrew Holyfield. It was because of all the baggage he's been carrying outside the ring over the past few years. Emotional baggage or no emotional baggage, these amateurs say biting has no place in fighting. I don't think he should have been him. He should have like headbutt him back. That's what I think. And those amateur boxers you just heard are from the Metro-Dade County Amateur Boxing Program at Tropical Park. These amateur boxers and this professional boxer are here at Garrett Leprechauns in Wynwood. You're not fighting any years, right? That's right. And people are just wondering, what's up with Mike Tyson? Why did he do this? Some people say, including some of the people here who run this program, that Mike Tyson is no longer a role model for young boxers. Live in Wynwood, I'm Brian Andrews, 7 News 19. All right, thank you, Brian, and watch yourself. Our 19 coverage now continues with Deuces Rogers. He's weighing in with reaction coming in from some other heavyweights, including the president, Deuces? Yes, the president will weigh in on this issue. It seems everyone has an opinion about what happened. But the big question, why did Mike Tyson do what he did? Well, members of the boxing world, some feel he was afraid he was going to lose, while others feel he simply lost it. See, look at him. You can see him. You can see him. There it is. That is the voice of Ferdy Pacheco, a.k.a. the Fight Doctor. He called Saturday night's fight, and he was a guest on Larry King Live. I think Mike Tyson's case, first and foremost, is what does Mike Tyson do about himself? The, the question doesn't stem from boxing. It doesn't stem from a headbutt. It stems from this fragmented and disorganized individual that's a rudderless ship who can't find his way around in life. But why would Mike Tyson do such a terrible thing? Kevin Rooney is the former champ's former trainer, and he says he knows the answer. He knew that Holyfield was going to beat him, so you know he took uh, he took the easy way. The easy way out may end up costing Tyson big in the long run. The Nevada State Athletic Commission will meet Tuesday to determine Tyson's punishment. I expect to pay the price like a man, 
and I accept the Nevada, Nevada State Athletic Commission to hand down a severe penalty. I only ask that it's not a penalty for life. The bite has even garnered attention from the White House. President Clinton said he saw the fight, and his reaction was like many, disbelief. I was horrified by it, and I think the American people are. And um, I don't know what the federal role should be. I've not given any thought to that whatever, but I, as, a, as a fan, and I was uh, horrified. Now the question arises, will there be a rematch? There was talk of it even before Saturday night's fight slash bite. Holyfield's people say no way. Mike Tyson does not deserve the privilege of fighting for a, a, a title against somebody like Evander Holyfield. Holyfield's people also go on to say somewhat half-heartedly that Mike Tyson should join Ultimate Fighting Championship, the sport where combatants fight until one can no longer continue. Well, as brutal as that sport is, it doesn't allow biting either. In the Plex, Deuces Rogers, 7 News 19. All right, thanks a lot, Deuces. Tonight, South Florida has spoken on the question of whether Tyson should be charged for biting Evander Holyfield and or taking a punch at a police officer after the fight. Did you see that? 63% of you say yes. Criminal charges should be filed against the heavyweight, while 37% of you said no, charges should not be filed. The study, of course, is unscientific, and we do thank you for your calls. And we have also brought in legal expert Howard Finkelstein. Of course, he's a lover, not a fighter, but he does have details on Tyson's next round, whether he might face criminal charges and whether he is in violation of his parole. And all of this is coming up in just about 20 minutes. Here's a programming note. Senior reporter Mark Ludner is on his way to Las Vegas, where Tyson's punishment is expected to be announced tomorrow by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. We will bring you that live as soon as it happens. And the night team is working a story you will see only on 7, a mystery child found wandering the streets of Northwest Dade. The night team's Glenna Milberg is there live for us tonight. Glenna, what have you found out? Well, Kelly, what we know right now is only that for five hours at very least, this little boy has been wandering around with no supervision. Detectives estimate he's about two years old. You're going to get a good look at him. In just a minute, the neighborhood we're in, a very dangerous one for a little boy by himself right off Miami Gardens Drive and Northwest 17th Avenue. This is where neighbors found him late this afternoon, happy and healthy, but very much alone. It seems this little guy is leaving the worrying to the adults, the ones who found him alone in the street in a dirty diaper at bare feet. A couple of people say they watched him wander for two hours before bringing him to this neighborhood mother of four for safekeeping. I changed him and I put him on some clothes. He said he was hungry, but when I tried to feed him, he didn't want to eat. He wanted to just play with my kids. <laughs> While the little ones played, detectives canvassed the neighborhood with the boy's photo. They found no one who knew him. Child exploitation detectives checked him out. No outward signs of abuse nor neglect. He seems, you know, pretty healthy for, uh, for a two-year-old, um, and he doesn't seem traumatized by anything. He seems like he gets along well with a lot of different people. Oh, yeah, he's not anybody. He's not anybody. He's not anybody. From his speech and agility, detectives estimate the boy is about two years old. They are baffled. Anyone could not know he's gone. Hopefully somebody will call with uh, somebody who's missing a child. Well, whatever happens in the next few hours, that child will most certainly be in state custody tonight because police just have too many questions for whatever kind of parent would allow their child to be in such a dangerous situation and unsupervised for so long. In Northwest State, I'm Glenna Milberg, 7 News, 19. The night team also working a case of amnesia tonight. Hospital officials say this man has no idea who he is. The patient was paralyzed in a motorcycle accident last month in North Dade, and since then he's been unable to tell doctors who he is. Doctors say they'd like to get help from him or either family or friends. If you have any information, you're being asked tonight to call Jackson Memorial Hospital. Seven Sky Force over Southwest Day today after a plane crashes in the backyard of a home on Southwest 167th Avenue. Officials say the pilot changed his mind about 
taking off from Tamiami Airport. However, he made his decision just a little too late. He was apparently trying to return, but he missed the landing strip and plowed through a fence. Luckily, in this case, nobody was injured. The Coast Guard rescues four people after they sent out an early morning mayday call. That's because their boat was sinking. The four, was found, the four were found floating in gasoline about six miles from Turkey Point. All were wearing their life vests. Tonight, Lamar is finally filling in that huge hole behind a residential community in Miramar. Last year, residents of Hampshire Homes found that tons of garbage was buried behind their homes. When they started to pull it out, they realized it kept going and going and going. By the time they finished, they had a lake behind their homes, and Lenar had a lawsuit to contend with. Tonight, the lawsuit is finally over with. Residents will get the hole filled, and each homeowner will get, who was affected anyway, will get a check estimated at $100,000. Well, we have dodged it for as long as we can. We have a weather alert coming in out of the Atlantic. That's because the season's first tropical depression formed late this afternoon. Meteorologist Bill Kamal in the Weather Center with his storm track tonight. Bill? And Kelly, I was all about to say tonight, uh, we've gone through the month of June and no systems, and that would have been the first time in four years. Here we are on June the 30th, and we have one. TD number one, 31.8, 75.9. This was at 5 o'clock. The 10 o'clock will be coming out closer to 11 today. It's 240 miles to the south of Hatteras. Winds are 35. It is moving east-southeast at 6. Notice the big ball of convection, these reds and yellows, but the actual center is to the left of that big area of convection because it's undergoing shear or a northwesterly wind in the upper levels of the atmosphere. That may be relaxing, though, over the next day or so. The official forecast track, though, has it moving east-southeast, then curving to the northeast, and by Thursday, about two or 300 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. But things could change. We'll keep you posted. This will not be affecting the U.S. East Coast anytime soon, but we'll have our forecast for you in about 20 minutes. We'll see you then. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Tonight, parents are counting down the hours, and it's now T-minus two hours and counting. What we're talking about is the countdown to curfew. This in Fort Lauderdale. The night team's Balky Snoray has been following the story, and she is joining us now live with the very latest as she grows before our very eyes. Balky's? Yeah, Rick, we're at Beach Place, which is one of the latest and greatest places where a lot of teenagers hang out during the weekend. But guess what? That is all about to change as of midnight tonight. If you are under 16 and you live in Fort Lauderdale, listen up, because here's what you need to know. This new teen curfew obviously applies to the city of Fort Lauderdale. Again, it applies to teenagers under the ages of 16. And these are the hours. It's going to be Monday through Friday from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. and Saturday and Sunday from midnight to 6 a.m., you get a, an extra hour, you need to be somewhere other than walking the streets of Fort Lauderdale, according to city officials here. If you do, in fact, get picked up, your first offense, well, you get a warning. Other offenses, well, you're going to be fined $50. What's going to happen is, what we've learned is that if, in fact, you're uh, under 16 and you get picked up, you don't get arrested, you get taken to police headquarters for questioning, your parents are called in or legal guardian, depending if it's your first offense or subsequent offense, you either get a written warning or your parents are going to have to pay $50. So uh, parents, if you're out there and come these times, you don't know where your kids are, you might want to find them because after tonight, it might cost you. What's interesting, though, is that a lot of the kids that we've talked to that are under 16 that this new rule is going to apply to say, hey, it's our summer. We don't care about the new curfew, and we're going to stay out for as long as we want. So we'll see how this whole thing will uh, come into play. Live in Fort Lauderdale, I'm Belkis Nure, 7 News, 19. All right, Belkis, tonight the anxious and anticipated end of an era as Britain hands over Hong Kong to communist China. And to formally mark this transition, the British flag was lowered in Hong Kong for the final time. Many Hong Kong residents say they are sad to see the British leave, but nonetheless, the Union Jack was officially replaced by the red five-star flag of China. Thousands gathered in China's Tiananmen Square to watch the dazzling display of fireworks there, the pomp and pageantry orchestrated by the Chinese government for the benefit of the International Press Corps gathered at the controversial site. Hong Kong, by the way, was seized from China after the Opium Wars of 1841. And British leaders make the transfer of power official toasting their Chinese counterparts just hours ago. Today and tomorrow have been declared national holidays, and that adds to these once-in-a-lifetime celebrations. That is one of the big stories that we are following for tonight. Here are some of the others. A South Florida business owner coming under deadly fire as cameras are rolling. And in the background, a toddler. A little boy's body becomes some sort of beehive tonight. How this 11-year-old survived. A recycling plant churning out one hot product. A killer warning goes out all over South Florida tonight. Uh -huh. 
Atlanta rock by bombing that now may have a South Florida connection. This one is only on South. And in tonight's edition of 7 News Reports, two bedrooms, two baths, and a brain? Yeah, we're talking about high-tech homes. It's straight ahead. We will be right back. Part by Rooms to Go. Find bigger selection and lower prices every day. And by Public Supermarkets. Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. Well, it seems smart technology has literally hit home. Yeah, you know, the houses that we live in already are a far cry when you think about it from what our parents had to uh, remote control this and remote control that. But now it's going to get even more high tech, supposedly to make our lives easier. Yeah, the night team's Kathy Marshall with tonight's edition of 7 News Reports. <laughs> Your house was just like the Jetsons. With a touch of a button, it could help you cook, vacuum, clean, and even unwind after a long day at work. Ah, this will happen. And the reason I can guarantee that is it's already happening now. Real life smart homes are just around the corner, packed with computer wizardry that will rival even the Jetsons. Rather than having keyboards and buttons everywhere, it'll just have beautiful objects, but the objects will be responsive. How about a smart kitchen where the frying pan warns you if you're overcooking the dinner? A refrigerator that tells you if your milk's gone bad? Or a countertop that can sense harmful bacteria and warn you when it needs to be cleaned? It's all possible in a smart home. That's a good idea. Really, it's a good idea. I think that it has a lot of advantages. I think it'd be nice. Your kitchen will even do your grocery shopping for you. Just scan your products into the computer and it'll have new groceries sent to your house when your food runs out. Oh, I think it would be wonderful. I'd, I'd enjoy it. I think it would simplify life tremendously. A lot of very, very simple tasks like that really are the solution to the kind of overload we have right now. Smart home conveniences are already popping up in the pads of the rich and famous. Microsoft founder Bill Gates is building a $50 million smart mansion. Here, sensors will follow you from room to room, automatically unlocking doors, turning on the lights, and adjusting the temperature to your preference. If you're sleepy, it could say, make the room colder to help wake you up. Here at MIT's Media Lab, experts are working on the next generation of smart home technology, high-tech thinking sensors for your walls and furniture. They'll turn your home into a virtual doctor, monitoring your heartbeat and temperature and warning you if you're sick. Instead of having a checkup um, once a year, your house can always be gathering low-level data about your biomedical signs. Had a bad day at the office? By reading your vital signs and body language, your house will soon be able to sense your mood and help you relax by turning on some soothing music, fixing a hot bath, whatever it takes. Yeah, I've seen that kind of stuff in, um, in movies. Take it. Take it. I don't think I'd be comfortable with it, to be honest with you. While smart homes won't brush your teeth or pass the salt, Thanks, dear. experts say they will offer one thing the Jetsons home doesn't, a full warranty. For 7 News, I'm Kathy Marshall. Yep, make your life easier, huh? Experts say many of these technologies could appear in homes over the next couple of years. We'll obviously follow it for you, and when they do, we'll let you know they're available. Yeah, really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's my guess. Although, I like the grocery store thing. Yeah, That's one good. thing you liked. One out of 15. <laughs> Still to come from the Newsflex tonight, a deadly delivery at a postal store, and this one plays out for the camera. The Fed's looking to a South Florida man to possibly help them solve the string of bombings in Atlanta. A not-so-sweet end to a sugar factory. And just coming in off the satellites, a tour group taking in a frightening sight. There it is. We're coming back in two. A deadly crime is caught on camera in West Palm Beach. This has a store owner being ambushed by masked men. And the night team's Pam Gigani is at the news desk. Putting these pictures together for us tonight, Pam. Yeah, Kelly, that owner in the back room when the three men stormed his store, and that is where police say he was shot. Just released surveillance video shows what it was like when bullets began to fly and how customers, including a toddler, could have easily been killed. Bullets blasting as three masked men hit a postal package store in West Palm Beach Friday. The owner killed by gunfire, shot, police say, in the back of the neck in a back room. 
a surveillance camera capturing the crime as it unfolded. Watch as the three thieves brazenly enter the store. One stays in view as the other two head straight for the back. Inside, at least three customers, including a toddler. The gunman, nervously waving his weapon around, forces them all to the ground. Then, seconds later, as the other two thieves make a run for the door, bullets begin to fly. Two shots appear to come from the back of the store as the gunmen fire back. Watch again as the thieves make a run for it, one actually ducking down behind a table to avoid being hit, while the gunman who forced the customers to the floor opens fire. And West Palm Beach police say that the store owner had a concealed weapons permit, and so they're unsure if he actually fired his own gun at the thieves. The owner was taken to the hospital after being shot in the back of the neck. He later died there. Police hope that this tape will help them catch these suspects. From the news desk, Pam Giganti, 7 News, 19. All right, thanks, Pam. And as we rove the news plaques, we have several other stories that we're following for you. Two suspected Russian mobsters are under arrest for allegedly trying to smuggle nuclear weapons into South Florida. Federal agents posing as arms brokers for drug smugglers taped the two Lithuanians offering the smuggled missiles and more from their homeland. Yes, if we were interested in any nuclear type weapons. Igla and Strela surface to air missiles. And um, they were offering to sell those to the U.S., which includes uh, rocket launchers and rockets. It's a reality. You know, you can't get away from it. It's reality, and it, it may happen again. Well, a Bulgarian company had agreed to ship the missiles and nuclear weapons, but agents were worried somebody would steal them along the way. All but one of the missiles for sale ended up in Iran. Agents say two years ago, the Lithuanians tried to set up a sport utility theft. It was a network operated right here in South Florida. Tonight we have the call made to 911 moments after a stinging attack. This little boy, 11-year-old Casey Jones, was playing outside a Fort Lauderdale hole, but he stumbled right into a wasp nest. Well, the wasp got all over him, and the neighbor said, Casey, jump into the pool. It'll help. It did. And here is the call that followed to 911. They're driving there now. Okay. Yes, great. Just hurry and tell us what we can put on it, please. Okay, there's nothing that you can put on it. There's nothing you can do. Nothing, no ice or anything? No, nothing is going to make a difference. Okay. What you need to do is just keep an eye on him. Well, Casey is in serious but stable condition tonight. Doctors say thanks to the neighbors' quick thinking, the boy is expected to make a full recovery. And a West Aid power plant goes up in flames this morning. Heavy smoke poured from the roof of the recycling plant on Northwest 97th Avenue. Investigators still don't know what sparked this fire, but nobody was hurt. In Miami, a man confined to a wheelchair is gunned down in broad daylight. Adolfo Cabrera. He was killed while leaving his apartment building this morning. Police say a man walked up to Cabrera and shot him several times in the head. That suspect, by the way, is still on the loose tonight. Police are urging anybody with information about this crime to call Dade Crime Stoppers. The number 471 tips. The FBI has issued a warning to South Florida's gay community. They say be on the alert for this man. 27-year-old Andrew Coonan is on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitive list. He is charged with murdering his lover and suspected of leaving a trail of bodies across the country since the month of April. Authorities now think he may be headed to South Florida. They thought that Andrew would be relocating down here primarily because of the population. He um, creates relationships with older, fluent men uh, in hopes of supporting himself financially. And uh, I, the, the way his record is running, that they end up as victims. And judging by those flyers, the last name would be Cunanan, Andy Cunanan. The flyers may be helping. The agency has reportedly received several tips already. Here's a story you're going to see only on 7 tonight. A South Florida politician claiming that he is the target of some threatening anti-gay letters. And those letters may have a connection to a series of bombings in Atlanta. But I team's John Turchin with more on the evidence. They look like nothing more than a pile of papers, but what you're looking at is FBI evidence that may help solve the recent bombings in Atlanta. In this particular letter, uh, in a highlighter pen, it said you're dead on the top. Wolf, you're a patsy and pawn of the police pigs. Kiss your campaign office goodbye because it's going up in smoke. Bomb threats, death threats, and a lot of anti-police, anti-government gibberish threatening letters. Ken Some Wolf received a series of threatening letters while running for a seat on the Fort Lauderdale yeah, City Commission back in 1994. Uh, be, he had received uh, a lot of so positive press, primarily because he was gay like and endorsed by several organizations. You know, 
He immediately turned the materials over to Fort Lauderdale police. The uh, police did say they had a lot of good fingerprints on the materials that I had, so maybe in the fingerprint database in Washington, there would be something. One phone call from one citizen, whether for a half million dollars or whether because they believe it's the right thing to do, can end this mystery, can secure the safety of the people, can secure the safety of the law enforcement community in this area. Wolf got in touch with the FBI after hearing that plea for help, an agent telling the country the bombing at Centennial Olympic Park, at and around an abortion clinic, and at a gay nightclub are probably the work of one person or one group. They introduced a threatening letter, an agent appealing to anyone who has received threats from those appearing to be anti-gay or anti-government. They wanted to get hold of all the originals and they wanted to interview me. Um, so we had an interview and they picked up from the Fort Lauderdale PD the original letters. Wolf's impressive political resume includes stints as deputy press secretary to now Governor Lawton Childs when he was a U.S. senator. He also coordinated the Childs gubernatorial campaign in South Florida back in 1990 and was a member of the state steering committee for President Clinton in 92. You never know, maybe, maybe the person that was writing these threatening letters to me is, on, is tied to a hate group. The letters are now being examined at the FBI crime lab in Washington, D.C. Now, whether or not they turn out to be anything significant probably won't be known for some time, if at all. Now, Wolf tells us that he isn't expecting any feedback. In fact, that's what he's been told. But one agent tells me if he does get a call, it would be a pretty good indication that they are on to something. In Fort Lauderdale, John Turchin, 7 News. Uh, we should tell you that we contacted the FBI here and in Atlanta as well, and the Fort Lauderdale Police Department, too. Each agency declined to comment on the record, saying they are in the midst of a still ongoing investigation. <laughs> Earlier in this newscast, we brought you pictures of a child who'd been found wandering in basically a T-shirt and a diaper. Well, apparently, someone claiming to be his mother has come forward. Yeah, Glenna Milberg has been following the story for us, and she's joining us now live once again. What do you know, Glenna? Well, Rick, Kelly, what a difference a half hour makes. We now know that this little boy's name is Arthur and that he's two years old and that he lives just about four blocks from where we're standing right now off Miami Gardens Drive. His mother called police after seeing the, this video, Arthur's picture on TV. Apparently, she was at work, and he was in care of his grandmother at home. And then late this afternoon, she thought that Arthur was sleeping upstairs when, in fact, this toddler was getting out his front door and walking around the streets of his neighborhood. It was his neighbors who called police and took care of him until they arrived. Detectives are at the house right now questioning everybody inside, including the mother and the grandmother. There could well be charges filed in this case. Coming up on 7 News at 11, we're going to let you hear from the mother exactly what happened to Arthur in her own words. So now I'm Glenn Milberg in Northwest State. All right, hopefully it was just an honest mistake. Yeah. Just ahead from the Newsplex tonight, a fire's burning desire has crews out west a little concerned tonight. Expect to pay the price like a man. Pay the price like a man. What you haven't heard from Mike Tyson as he attempts to keep his career off the ropes. And why a dangerous demolition has hundreds saying, sugar, we're coming right back. I'm Marilyn Mitchell in the Health Center. A new treatment relieves some type of back and neck pain, including whiplash. You're going to see it in HealthCast. 7 News brought to you in part by Isuzu, equipment for real life. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Robinson. He is a real-life karate kid and he's considered one of the best in the world. You'll meet him tomorrow on Today in Florida starting at 6. Closed caption brought to you in part by All Broward Hurricane, America's oldest and largest shutter manufacturer. Mike Tyson has been in trouble before, but this time he admits he snapped when he took a chunk out of the champ's ear. Yeah, and just as we promised you at the top of the newscast, more now on the prepared text and the apology. Van, I'm sorry. You're a champion. I respect that. And I only sat in that the fight didn't go on further that I apologize to the world, to my family. I just, I just snapped and reacted and did what many athletes have done and had and have paid the price for it. For an athlete in the heat of battle to suddenly lose it, it's not new, but it's not right. And for me, it doesn't change anything. I was wrong. 
and I expect to pay the price like a man, and I accept the Nevada, Nevada State Athletic Commission to hand down a severe penalty, and I am here today to say I will not fight it. I only ask that it's not a penalty for life. For this mistake, I will instruct my managers and promoters to waive any time restricting so that the penalty can begin immediately. I only ask that you forgive me and have you forgiven other athletes of, of, of this profession in sports and so that I can be given a chance to redeem myself and I will learn from this horrible mistake too. I have reached out since Saturday to ask my God, praise be to Allah, to help me and to renew my faith. I grew up in the streets. I fought my way out, and I will not go back. Howard Finkelstein joining us now. Howard, do you think that was written by a public relations man or a lawyer? Well, I think it was written by someone who does both, because this man needs to plead his case as soon as possible before the consequences start raining down on him. All right, quick question here. Uh, two issues that we're dealing with. One is the bite on the ear, and the other one is when he took a swing at a police officer after the fight. As I see it, the first one is probably not something they can file charges on. The second, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you, technically, they could file charges on both because even though boxing is a brutal sport, certainly it is not only outside the rules of bite, but this type of savage bite was something that can only be classified as a crime. And then he was warned, and he did it a second time. So if they wanted, they could file criminal charges. And clearly, the second time when he started swinging at police officers and others, that would be a crime if it was anybody else other than someone who was a celebrity in the ring. Howard, most of the world knows that Mike Tyson is on probation for that rape conviction out of the state of Indiana. Any chance that could affect his probation terms? Uh, Kelly, absolutely. If this judge wanted to, based upon what took place in that ring, they could violate his probation. Remember, it's a form of parole because he was convicted of rape. And if that judge sees that the face that Mike Tyson exhibited in the ring was the same face that Desiree Washington experienced when she was raped, she could call this a violation of parole and send him back to prison. Did that prepared statement do anything at all to help him today? I think so. I think that people were very, very outraged. And although people still are outraged, there are some who might feel now that the consequences don't have to include prison. Maybe they won't violate the parole. We've already heard the law enforcement officials saying they don't think that they're going to file charges. So maybe they have stemmed the tide, and maybe the consequences will not be as severe as they could have been. But we just heard you say that this could be a violation of parole even if he's not charged? Even if he is not charged, it could be a wow. violation of parole, although it is unlikely that they will call it a violation of parole if no charges are filed. And it is rare indeed that a law enforcement officer has a swing taken at him and charges aren't filed. Maybe this is a special form of Las Vegas justice. Uh, well, initially the judge says he doesn't think it'll violate his probation, but he hasn't looked at it closely. Howard Finkelstein, we thank you very much. Senior reporter Mark Ludner is going to be in Las Vegas tomorrow. The reason? Well, the punishment may be coming down. It will be handed down, we expect, by the Athletic Commission of that state. We're going to bring you this live as soon as it happens. Lots of stories coming in off the satellites tonight. First, South Carolina. Home video shows a tour boat with more than 50 people on board as it catches fire. Coast Guard officials broke windows trying to get everybody off the boat safely. One person was hurt, but that's all. Tonight, this fire is still under investigation. In Utah, firefighters nearing Salt Lake City trying to contain a range fire before it gets to a chemical weapons research yeah, site there. They were able to put it out, but not before it destroyed nearly 2,000 acres. No word tonight on how the fire actually started. Apparently some Philadelphia building inspectors are lucky to be alive tonight. This building seemed to have a mind of its own. Crews tried to demolish the old Jack Frost Sugar Company four different times. The building just would not come down. 13 hours later, it collapsed on its own, sending inspectors running, but still, no one was hurt. Also off the satellites tonight, a tanker carrying thousands of gallons of gasoline, spilling its cargo on a Georgia interstate, about 10,000 gallons, poured onto the highway as crews frantically worked to clean it up. The leak has been capped, but the cleanup 
We're told could take all night. A million miles from Earth, NASA satellites <coughs> have captured the picture of an asteroid. The images show a battered, cold, black surface with one crater several miles deep. The NASA spacecraft got these pictures while on its original mission of photographing another asteroid named Eros. Other stories that we're following for you tonight, the fiery collision and this one involving several police officers. A small box may lead to a big break when it comes to stolen cars. Also, why a little fat in your diet may mean little sex in your life. Mm. You put the two together, we'll do it for you. Stay tuned. Now, time for seven weather with Bill Kamal. The Northwest is the only cool spot, 80s and 90s, for most of the rest of the U.S. There's the trough in the west and the ridge in the east, 93 today in Bangor, Maine. It was hot, but not too humid. Starting off in the east with seven sky scan, beautiful over the northeast, then the clouds, and then the clouds get thicker as the thunderstorms envelop much of the Gulf Coast today and parts of Florida, and this big blob that is sitting out east of South Carolina right now and south of Hatteras is Tropical Depression 1. New coordinates, 31.7 north, 76 west. It's moving little, but it should resume an east-southeast motion tomorrow with 35 mile per hour winds. It's very close to tropical storm strength, and if the shear relaxes that northwest flow over the system, it could become on it tomorrow. We'll keep you posted on that. Meanwhile, we're going to have a west to northwest wind and then a sea breeze at the coast, and that means even with a high UV index and a lot of sun early tomorrow, a good chance of afternoon storms. Maybe a few showers over the Keys tonight. Tomorrow, hot, steamy sun again, low 90s. The thunderstorms likely, some of them could be strong. Light winds will become onshore. The surf at 84. And not much change, at least through Thursday, perhaps better on Friday. Rick. All right, thanks a lot, Bill. Here's another big story we're following. Tonight, a small box is helping customs agents stop the smuggling of stolen cars out of South Florida. And you'd think somebody would have thought of this a long time ago, like when LoJack first was introduced to South Florida. But no, it's taken this long. An insurance company has finally donated a LoJack electronic tracking device to the place where all the stolen cars congregate in South Florida. LoJack, as you know, can zero in on the silent signal coming in from a stolen car, but the signal can only be traced if you install the system in your car. Well, customs agents say tools like LoJack are a start when it comes to stopping the smuggling out of the port of Miami. There are a lot of stolen cars in Florida. As I said earlier, it's just an additional tool. If we're leading the country now, any tool that anyone can donate to us will be glad to use. We're going to be maintaining stats from this day forward. So yes, from now on, there will be a low jack right there at the port of Miami where all these cars, like this one and those, are heading overseas. Officials tell us at least 40,000 cars are stolen from the streets of South Florida each and every year. Still to come tonight from the Newsplex, an explosion turns a packed passenger train into a massive fireball. More on a night team exclusive as a mystery child is found wandering the streets. And just a few minutes ago, somebody calling to say, that's my son. And jewelry proves to be a gem of an insect repellent. We'll be back. Seven Weather, brought to you in part by FPL. A sighting shrouded in secrecy. What's the real truth behind this UFO controversy? Roswell, 50 years later, 7 News reports, tomorrow at 5 and 10. And now, 7 Hellcast with Marilyn Mitchell. A new treatment offers pain relief, the danger of eating too little fat, a bracelet that gets bugs to bug off, these stories and more in today's HealthCast. A new treatment can bring relief for some types of neck and back pain, especially whiplash. It's called rhizotomy. Auto accidents very commonly produce this kind of neck injury, sports injuries, and people uh, who are usually in their 50s or older who, with just normal wear and tear of the spine, will have some arthritis in the joint. How about now? Do you feel it? Using a special radio frequency generator, the treatment works by killing tiny hair-like nerves along the spine. Patients report quick and sometimes lasting relief. If it returns, the procedure can be repeated. <laughs> Your genes may determine how well you do after undergoing angioplasty to unclog heart arteries. Researchers have found that some people's arteries will reclog much faster if they have a certain type of gene. The discovery could help doctors identify patients at risk of reclogging and lead to better treatments. Did you know that a very low-fat diet can cause testosterone levels to drop? The hormone is vital for muscle mass, strength, energy, and libido. Bottom line, the body needs a balance of nutrients, including some fat. 
Just because kids have ear tubes doesn't mean that they can't go swimming this summer. The solution? Earplugs. They prevent water from getting in and infection. And finally, if you don't like the thought of inhaling bug sprays or rubbing chemicals into your skin to keep insects away, there is something new you may want to try, a bracelet called the Bug Chaser. The plastic band gives off a citrusy scent that bugs don't like. It promises to keep them 10 feet away from you. You can wear it on your wrist or ankle. The Bug Chaser lasts about two weeks. It costs three bucks, and you can get it at Walgreens. That's HealthCast. John Marilyn Mitchell, 7 News. Thank you, Marilyn. The stories that we're going to follow for you tonight, the Marlins and Bay. Historic Fenway Park to face the Red Sox. Yes, you're right. That is an American League team they're playing. We'll have the highlights and the explanation. And then later, the gloves are off, and Mike Tyson is preparing for another big fight. Our coverage on this one continues on 7 at 11. 7 News, brought to you in part by Mazda and by Circuit City. Time for 7 Video Sports with Deuces Rogers. Tomorrow, the Nevada State Athletic Commission will decide what to do with Mike Tyson. Today, Tyson went with a preemptive strike. No biting, just apologies. Iron Mike admitting he just snapped Saturday night. In case your name is Rip Van Winkle, this is what we're talking about. Tyson biting a Vander Holyfield twice. Today, Tyson, the biter, apologized to many, starting with Evander, the bitee. Evander, I'm sorry. You're a champion. I respect that. And I only sat in that the fight didn't go on further that, for that the boxing fans of the world might have seen the, for themselves who would come out on top. When you butted me in the first round, accidentally or not, um, I, I snapped in reaction, and the rest is history. As is Holyfield's ears as our Holyfield's here. Marlins in historic Fenway Park tonight, and while the Fish were playing baseball, the Bosox were playing kickball. To Fenway Park we go, one of the oldest the parks in the majors, but also one of the best. Top of the first, no score, bases loaded for Gary Sheffield. That's not out, but it still does some damage. The throw to the plate will go somewhere off your screen. Four errors for Boston, three nothing Marlins. Bottom of two, Boston gets them all back. Troy O'Leary with a three-run blast off Alex Fernandez, deepest part of the park. Game tied at three. After that, all fish. Luis Castillo with a shot to right. Darren Bragg, Ole. Bobby Bo scores. 4-3 Marlins. Top of the eighth. Jim Eisenreich visits the Green Monster. The Marlins explode for eight runs in this 8-5 victory. Braves and Yankees, last time these two met, destiny belonged to the Big Apple. Andy Pettit was cruising along until this. Javi Lopez with a shot off Pettit's leg in the fifth. He would leave with a bruised calf. Top of the ninth, no score. Runners on second and third for Mike Mordecai. It looks like a run will score, but Charlie Hayes guns them. We're now scoreless in the 10th inning. The AL announced its starters for next week's All-Star game. Ken Griffey Jr., the leading vote-getter. Justice and Brady Anderson join him in the outfield. Tino Martinez, Robbie Alomar, Ripken, A-Rod, and Yvonne Rodriguez round out the infield. Edgar Martinez is your DH. The NL starters will be announced tomorrow. Basketball now. Tulsa head coach Steve Robinson, who signed a seven-year deal just three months ago, has resigned to take the head job at FSU. An official announcement is expected tomorrow. The Heat showed off their new draft picks this afternoon. First round, Charles Smith and second rounder, Mark Sanford. Pat Riley hopes to have both signed and ready to go in the near future. But the big story concerning the Heat still has to do with this man. Sixers four, Derek Coleman. Last week, Pat Riley confirmed that the Heat are interested, but now he admits the price may be too high. That's probably a good thing. Coleman has a reputation as being lazy. You know, everybody takes a look at, at a person's flaws <laughs> and not at what their strengths are. So, uh, you know, we're aware of all the things that were said, but I'm, you know, I'm not overly concerned about it. If we could make a deal that could help the Miami Heat, I would make it, but I don't think that's going to happen. Which probably means it wills. To Wimbledon, second seed of Monica Sellis, latest upset victim. She and Sandrine Testu split the first two sets. Third set, Testu with the volley. They're tied at six. Testu now serving for the match. She just freezes Sellis with the ace. Sandrine Testu wins. Love six, six, four, eight, six. Finally tonight, back to baseball. Before the Marlins left for Beantown, Steve Shapiro gave them a course in linguistics. You know what they say, when in Boston, you must speak like the Bostonians. Car and Pac. Fenway Park. Fenway Park. 
Park the car. Fenway Park. <laughs> Boston one. <laughs> Can you say Fenway Park the way they say it? Yeah, it is Fenway Park. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a New Yorker, man, not a Bostonian. <laughs> I, can't, I don't have it down pat. Fenway Park. <laughs> I don't know. That's what we need, more people to talk like Steve. Rick and Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jesus. That'll do it. First to ten. Seven at 11 is next. Next on seven at 11. Mike Tyson is now fighting to keep his career alive. A plane makes a pit stop in a South Dade backyard. And history in Hong Kong. 7 at 11 is next. 7 News brought to you in part by Miami Seaquarium.